Hello again, it's Gail Cameron from My Pocket Coach and it's very good to be here in a series of leadership discussions with our top leaders. And today we have with us Christopher Kistasami. So Christopher, I'm just going to give you a little bit on his background, has been an executive and leader in IT over two decades, where you have provided sound technical leadership from development to implementation of innovative technical strategies that are aligned with business goals. Chris has qualified with a master's in technology. And Chris, what amazes me is the ease with which you manage enterprise-wide platforms across organizations. And it really puts you at the leading edge of technology in a digital era. So what has been an amazing experience for you, especially being in IT during COVID? Well, firstly, thanks so much, Gail. It's an absolute privilege to be on the platform with you and uh, to be chatting to you again. Uh, and uh, I look forward to, uh, to having more conversations as we, as we go. In terms of the, the question that you've asked, um, I think there's so many fantastic opportunities that COVID has created. I mean, apart from all of the challenges, obviously, uh, that we've seen, but the opportunities are quite, uh, quite phenomenal. And I must say that I've experienced a lot of businesses that have actually thrived during this period just because of them looking at things differently, you know. And in the world of technology, I think it, places people in this space in a very unique position where you have the advantage of using technology to really create value for, for different types of, of, uh, of solutions and customers and, and people that work with. What I've seen so far in my space was just um, the productivity level increase in how you engage with people um, using these di different platforms, you know, and uh, for me, initially, when, I, when we got into COVID, I was a little bit concerned about, you know, how will you work with teams and how would you engage with people? And yes, there are downsides to it, as I'm sure we will unpack in terms of, you know, just fatigue and all of those things. But just, being see just seeing people embracing technology in this difficult period, whether it's to connect with family, to connect with friends or to connect, connect with team, team members, it has been quite phenomenal for me to see the power of technology in really difficult situations. And, uh, and that just keeps me excited to see the impact that technology can have on the world uh, in a positive manner. So I think at a practical level, that's been most exciting for me during this time, you know. Well, that's amazing, Chris, because as you say, you're in the IT game and to see how it has enhanced people's mm -hmm. lives and enable people to, you know, continue with their businesses in, in very challenging circumstances. So what has been an important lesson that you've learned in your career? I think from a, from a leadership perspective, Gail, I think for me, the most important lesson that I've learned is that leadership is actually not about me. Um, it's a very fundamental uh, lesson that I've had to learn over my career, that leadership is about others and it's not about, it's not about oneself. And I think once you've embraced that, um, you start to realize the impact that you can have and the power of leadership. So from a leadership perspective, important when I realized that, that my job as a leader is really to try and assist people to connect with purpose, you know. And uh, as you and I both know, in the time that we've spent together, values are very important to me. And, and leaders, uh, for me, have such an important role to create a space and an environment for people to connect with purpose um, and to really empower them to actually find their true purpose, you know. And, um, and I think that has been the most important lesson around leadership that I've learned is that if you are able to connect people with purpose and create a space for them to do that, that's really where the magic happens, you know. And uh, I think more leaders that embrace that uh, start to realize the impact that you can have on people's lives. And perhaps the last comment that I'd just like to make on that is that, you know, people use the cliche that leadership is a choice. Uh, but if you really interrogate that statement, it's actually very true. Um, it is a choice that one has to make to say, I'm going to empower other people and that it's going to be about other people rather than myself. Mm -hmm. And that's why if you look at the sciences, there's a fundamental difference between leadership and management. And for me, it took me time to realize that, but I, I, it became such an, uh, an inspiring insight 
when you realize that the true value of leadership is empowering others. And that's been the most valuable lesson that I've learned here. And I love the word that you use, that leadership is about that magic. You know, because you are the tone setter, you are the keeper of that human climate, you know, and you are the motivator. So more than ever before, especially in challenging times, leadership is, is so important. How have you built confidence or resilience over the course of your career? That's a very interesting question because, I mean, I've noticed that, and I'm sure you would probably have experienced that yourself with the people that you work with, that as you perhaps get older and get more experiences, I think things change over a period of time. So if I think about when I started my career to where I am today, uh, and if you ask me the question when I started my career, I probably would have given you a different answer, you know. <laughs> but where I'm sitting at today, I think there's a few things that are important for me. One is that um, I believe that people have to really know their craft. So I talk about striving for mastery in your craft. So I think one of the fundamental things in terms of confidence and resilience for me has been that I have to know my, my craft very well. So spend a lot of time understanding your craft, learning your craft, being the best that you can be in your craft. So I think that would be the first thing that I'd, I'd like to share with you. The second one for me was around surrounding yourself with great positive people. And there's two aspects to that. One is uh, positivity is important for me because it creates um, another word that I like to use is that is that magic in terms of meeting of minds, you know, when you work in a space where, as you know, in the neuroscience space, Gail, much better than me, you know, when you feel energized, positive, the right chemicals start to work in your brain and you start to get really great results. So, um, so positive people is important, but also surrounding yourself with people that you can learn from that are better than you. Um, and, and I use the word better not in its traditional sense, because it's not just around technical skills. It's just overall that I've got more experience and that I've, that I've seen life in, in many different perspectives. So surrounding yourself with people that are great and positive, I think, is important. The other part for me um, that took me a bit of time to learn, but was that you have to be comf comfortable being uncomfortable. So putting yourself into uncomfortable situations creates room for you to learn and grow. And uh, it's only when you are uncomfortable that your brain starts realizing that you have to think about new things in order to get through these situations. So being uncomfortable is really important. Um, the other thing that I think is, is quite important for me is don't settle for the status quo. Um, you know, if you, if you really want to drive change and want to be great, you have to be able to push, you have to want to push the boundaries, you know, and not settle for the status quo. That requires some values that sometimes people find difficult, like things like courage, things like being able to speak when uh, you're probably not in the, um, in, uh, you, you, you're probably not sure whether you want to say something at that time. So courage is important. Um, and the other two points that I'd like to leave with you just on this, which are quite important to me is have a positive outlook on life. You know, the worst thing for me is that when, <laughs> when you get into a situation and you engage with people that are just negative uh, about things, you know, and, and, um, and I always found myself to live my life in that idea of saying that the glass is, um, is half full uh, rather than half empty, you know. So have a positive outlook in life. And if you do that, I believe that things will always work out in the end. Um, and I think we've discussed that a number of times in, in our journey as well, um, Gail. And then when things are tough, finally, when things are tough, this is when you really need to show up because um, it's then when your resilience and your experience comes to play. Um, it's easy to do it when things are going well and things are going your way. But when things are tough, um, that's when you need to show up. Now, that means that you have to be comfortable as well with the fact that sometimes things will fail. And that's just the nature of life. Failure is part of learning. So I think those are perhaps a few insights that I'd like to leave with you around that. Uh, and a lot of them I've engaged with you as well on. So, yes. Those are wonderful uh, pearls of wisdom, Chris. And I know when we worked together, we talked about the value of optimists versus pessimists. And I think I mentioned that, you know, it's hardwired in the brain. You're either born an optimist or a pessimist. But the important yes. thing is that optimists, you know, um, outlive pessimists by about 19%. So <laughs> there's a very good reason to, to be <laughs> positive. You live longer. Yes. So describe a difficult time when you almost gave up. And what did you do 
to stay motivated? Sure, I was thinking about and reflecting on this question. I must say there's so many, you know, when you think about your, your life and career. But the one that stood out for me just from a professional perspective was that when I had moved to Johannesburg from Cape Town, probably about 12 years ago, you know, um, I had moved uh, to a new job uh, in the financial services world. And um, I had left my home and, uh, and uh, you know, I'd been in Cape Town for about 10 years prior to that, you know, and so... Um, and my wife and I had just sold up our house and, and just decided that we're moving for this great opportunity. And at that time, it was interesting because we were, my wife was pregnant with our second child. And, um, and so it was, a, it was quite a strange time to make a move. But Gail, as you know, with me, as I've always said, you know, I'd like to do things the difficult way, right? So, so when we got here, um, you know, it was a great opportunity and everything was working out well. And about, about 10 months into the job, the company started to do this uh, the cycle of entrenchments, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and I mean, I was so, I didn't know what to do because I had sold up my, my house in Cape Town. I've moved my, my little son and now my wife was pregnant with this, with our second kid. And, uh, and I, you know, I sort of just packed up and moved from Cape Town. And so this process started and, uh, I was really struggling to figure it out. Um, you know, I wasn't sure whether I would be on the list of people that would be retrenched. And um, there were many, many thoughts going through my mind. So just, you know, to cut a long story short, it was a very difficult period, you know. And, um, and what I had to realize was that the, the point that I mentioned earlier was that I had to say to myself that, you know what, whatever happens is going to happen the way that it's supposed to be. So I had to, I had to sort of reflect in my mind and be comfortable with whatever's going to happen here is going to happen the way that it's supposed to be. So that's the one part, being comfortable in your mind that things are going to be okay. But that's not enough because, <laughs> you know, as you know, in life, you have to also take action, right? And, and action, um, but you have to be comfortable with where you are at so that the action is not from an emotional perspective, but it's from a logical perspective. And then the action was to say, okay, I'm in Johannesburg now. The, this is the hub of the economy. I'm sure I can find a job if I, if I put my mind to it, you know? And, uh, and I think... Um, uh, I, I, it took me a bit of time because I watched colleagues being retrenched. I watched people that I just met moving on. So that was quite difficult. But then I started just saying to myself, I'm going to put my CV out there and see what happens and start talking to people, knowing that I'm new in Johannesburg. And, uh, and, the, and, and the funny thing about it was that, and it's an important lesson that I learned, was that when you put yourself out there um, and you start to put out positive thoughts, you know, positive things happen to you as well, which comes back to our earlier conversation. And I must say, I was very blessed and privileged to get a job uh, very soon before anything happened to me and offer with, a, with, a, with Standard Bank at that time, funnily enough. And, um, and I remember when I joined, my, the week that I joined, my wife gave birth to a beautiful little girl. And uh, I was just saying to myself that, you know, um, it's so amazing that things just work out. So I think the two lessons that I wanted to leave uh, with you, Gail, on this point is that one is that things will work out the way that they need to. Even in your worst situation, you know, if you can, if you can sort of um, agree with yourself that, you know what, things will work out and then take action um, that, that actually sets you apart to say, now I'm taking action because I've acknowledged the problem and now I'm starting to take action to see how can I get out of the situation and using positive thoughts to get yourself out there, you can actually come out of a, a situation. So I think those were the lessons that I, that I had learned that things are never as bad as they seem. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you have the right outlook, things will work out. Now that being said, it's uh, easier said than done, Gail, and I must admit that, right? It's not easy. I mean, there are people in our country that go through very difficult times on a daily basis. And so what I'm, I just want to be conscious of is that I'm not saying that it's just easy to, to get out of your situation, but I'm saying that there are things that one can do to help you to actually better your situation, um, and that is in your control. Um, I think those are the thoughts that I'd like to leave around that. That's, that's beautiful because it's as the great uh, Arctic explorer, Sir Ernest Shackleton, said, often when things look the worst, they turn for the best. So it's almost like a tolerance of just acceptance, you know, of where you are, but without stupidity, you know, looking at, okay, so, you know, what, what can I look at doing? What other possibilities are there? And, and remaining in a positive frame, as you say, allows that positivity to come towards you a lot quicker. So how did you stay 
motivated to make Yes. You know, this COVID, the pandemic has really taken us all by, um, you know, it's, I, I, I say that it's sort of flatlined all of us, you know, we never, we, we, we really didn't expect something like this to happen. Um, and um, so I think there are three levels that I look at it at. One is at an emotional level, I must be honest, it has been taxing um, in terms of just trying to be motivated, you know, and trying to stay motivated. But what I found at an emotional level is for me, it's quite important to be, um, I like to use the word uh, spiritually grounded, you know, so, so for me, whatever that is for individuals and for the viewers of your program, you know, I think that's important to lean on that part of your life. Uh, and for me, I found that, you know, um, spending time meditating and, 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 and looking to that uh, perspective of life helps you to be more um, motivated. So the spiritual aspect for me is important. Uh, I try and, and spend as, as much time as I can to, to give myself energy from that perspective. Then on the, on the other perspective around, um, let's call it the professional aspect, I think the thing is that we also mustn't be too hard on ourselves because, you know, you can't, you can't necessarily, you just, this COVID thing just sprang up on us. So it's, it's not like you can just automatically change who you are and how you work today into something else tomorrow. So we mustn't be too hard on ourselves, but we must be open to learning. And I think sometimes what happens, Gail, is that, you know, people just want to use the same behaviors that they did pre-COVID in, in, in a COVID and post-COVID world. I and mean, that's not going to work. So at a professional level, for me, it's important that you take the time to learn new techniques, new behaviors, new skills that can also keep you motivated and inspired. I mean, I was saying to a colleague of mine the other day that, you know, this is a prime time for one to, to really learn new skills, you know, uh, technology around there and the different platforms today give you so many opportunities in terms of learning new skills and trying new things. So that's, that's, that's from a professional perspective, I found that, that, um, that using the time uh, to try and really reskill yourself and, uh, and whether it's through reading books or whatever the platform you choose to, it's a great thing. And then the last dimension for me is saying that, you know, so how do you think about things post COVID? Because COVID is not going to be here forever. So also having a forward-looking perspective on how do you want to operate in a world post-COVID. And I think for me, uh, it's important to do that. And some of the techniques I've used is even with the coaches that I have today, I've got a great coach as well that I'm working with today. And uh, we talk about having journals and writing down ideas. And so there are many techniques around it, but I just wanted to highlight that you've got to look at things from a professional perspective, from an emotional perspective, and also from a forward-looking perspective to make sure that you are able to sort of plot your path as you progress to these things. Um, but there are days that are better than others. And as human beings, you know, we never always have the, the best of days every day. So don't be too hard on yourself as well. I'm so glad you brought up the fact, uh, you know, that you also do meditation. I mean, many of the great leaders are, are using meditation and scientific research around that is showing that when you do regular mindfulness and meditation exercises, it reduces the smoke detector in the brain and it increases memory and, you know, the learning centers in the hippocampus, which is amazing. So thank you for sharing that. So what changes uh, do we need to be mindful of in a post-COVID world? Yes, I mean, I think, Gail, that is the question of the century, right? A lot of people are trying to unpack this, um, this question now across the world. And uh, I think there's a few things that, that we need to perhaps acknowledge first, is that the world will never be the same again. We have to acknowledge that, you know. And, uh, and uh, once we've done that, we have to realize that um, we've got to think about things in a new way. We have to see things in a new way, you know. And uh, I always like the idea of, you know, when you think about um, when, uh, when the first rains come, um, you know, and after things are dusty and all of that, and you get these first rains that come. There's a smell in the air that gives you a, there's a scent in the air that talks about, you get the feeling that something is new, something is refreshed, you know, and, uh, and, and the smell and your senses actually talk to that as well. So for me, post-COVID, we've got to think about it from that perspective to say that this is an opportunity for us to really uh, look at things differently with a new perspective, with a new lens. 
And then if we open ourselves to doing that, the opportunities are going to start showing up, you know, but we have to make sure that we don't try and solve new problems in the way that we did previously, because what COVID has taught us is that the way we have to approach things going forward has to be with new ideas and, and with new ways of thinking and new ways of working, et cetera, et cetera. Now that is going to challenge a lot of beliefs uh, and let me call it the status quo of corporates and of how people live their lives. It's going to challenge a lot of that. So I think for me, one of the biggest lessons would be to be open to trying out new things post COVID and having that idea of being agile and flexible in your approach to things. Um, I think that's an important message that I think I'd like to share with you. And then, and then being clear that the, the world is the world out there um, is not finite. We don't know everything. And post COVID, we're probably going to deal with a lot of new challenges that we've never even thought about, you know? And so we have to have this open mindset in terms of dealing with it. And from a leadership perspective, uh, it's so important that we really give people space to come up with new ideas, new approaches, um, change some of the policies in our corporate world, change some of the procedures based on how things are. So we've got to listen and we've got to learn and be open to that. Uh, I think those are the points that I are most are sitting top of mind for me right now, Gay. Awesome. No, thank you, Chris. And, and as you said, it's you know, being mindful of, of, of what to do. So describe your leadership style and how has this served you through your career? Yeah, I think for me, uh, I describe my style as, uh, as a bit of a, a transformative leadership style. So uh, what does that mean? Is that for me, as I said in the beginning, you know, uh, my, my value system is very important to me. And what I try to do to most organizations that I go to and most teams that I work with is to start with being able to understand what our values are, what our purpose is. And if you have a value-based approach to driving out, um, you know, organizational change or those types of things, I find that it has worked very well for me. So my style is to really try and uh, connect people with purpose and to try and create a space for them to understand this is what's in it for you. Uh, now, with that comes a lot of ideas around, you know, uh, uh, let's call it characteristics or behaviors of, of thinking about being mindful, uh, making sure that you're empathetic in terms of your approach to leadership, making sure that you create a psychologically safe environment for people to work in, understanding that uh, at the end of the day, it's people that actually drive the success of the organization. So I think to summarize, Gail, for me, I found that uh, my style is not necessarily about the numbers and the KPIs and the KRAs and those types of things. What I found is that if I can get people to really connect with values of an organization and to really connect with purpose and how they play a role in that, the results are absolutely phenomenal. Um, and that is the style that I found uh, that works best for me. And ultimately, I think, you know, through all of the, the, the work that even you guys do, all of us as leaders are trying to find how do we get the best out of our people. And my style has found that if I can deal with that first, I'm able, the KPIs, the KRAs, the numbers come automatically thereafter. You know? That's beautiful because, you know, the purposeful leaders do create environments where teams catch fire. And, and Absolutely. That's what we need. So our last question today is, what advice would you like to give to the next generation of leaders? Sure, that one is, uh, is quite, a, quite an interesting question, also difficult at the same time. I think for me, um, you know, there's a few things that uh, I've, I've seen. Um, number one is that, you know, we're living in a world that is so different. The, the skills of the future are going to be so different to what we have uh, traditionally learned in our schooling system, in our education system. So it's exciting from that perspective. So my first bit of advice would be that, you know, um, don't be um, sort of, don't be too focused on what you've learned traditionally, you know, be open to learning new skills. I say to people in uh, or companies that I speak to and colleagues that I've worked with is that we come through an era where we used to talk about uh, sort of a jack of all trades and a master of none, you know, that approach to life. And I believe with these new skills, we have an actual opportunity to become a, um, you know, a master of all trades and a jack of none. 
which is so interesting for me because we have an opportunity to really learn new skills. So my my first um, bit of advice would be for the next generation would be really take advantage of the opportunities that they are available for you to learn so many new skills. The second one, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, is take the time to master your craft. You know, some things that we've grown up with, uh, with Gail um, through different eras and value systems is that, you know, um, being an expert is still important, um, uh, but not necessarily in, from, a, from the perspective of where, you know, you have to show that you're an expert and you know everything. It's being a really great at your craft gives you a seat at the table. So I think that's important. So take time to master your craft. Um, the other thing that is so important for me is listening. You know, uh, it took me a long time in my career to learn that this is such an important uh, skill. And listening is, is really important. And I find that a lot of people today, um, and it's not just a new generation, it's also older generations, that um, they, they sometimes forget that listening is equally as important as speaking, you know. And so taking time to, uh, to, uh, to really hone in on the skill of listening, it can really create um, a real change in an, in, in an environment, you know. And then some other basic ones like empathy, like trying to put yourself in the shoes of other people. Those are quite important. Um, the two last points that I want to leave with you that I find quite important for me is one is this idea of instant gratification. Um, that I think we all suffer from today across the world. Sometimes it's great, but sometimes it actually results in you missing very important opportunities that patience sometimes brings to the table. So not everything needs to follow the instant gratification approach. Uh, we, even though we live in the world of social media and Twitter and Facebook and all of these, that doesn't mean that, uh, that that's the right approach. So I'm saying leave room for other approaches. And then last but not least, um, you know, Gail, it's such an important saying that I, 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 I live by myself. I can't remember the person that said it, but I'll leave you with the words, you know. Um, and I've, I've kept this with me. It's that people will always or will forget what you've said and they'll forget what you've did, what you have done, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And I think for me, that's really important. If you can really make sure that you impact people and you leave them feeling inspired and excited, I think uh, that would be my message for the next generation. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Kate. Thank you for those wonderful words. <laughs> it's really been awesome. And we look forward to it.